This film consists of a series of short vignettes designed to help you get in touch with your own feelings and beliefs and how society fosters these beliefs. The film will be stopped after each vignette so that the issues presented and your reactions to them can be discussed. Good evening. I'm here to deliver a warning. The film you're about to watch is both extremely long and incredibly dry. If your eyes do water, it will be from yawning and nearly falling asleep, and not from the expression of any genuine emotions. But that's the way they want it. Not the filmmakers, who've slaved away for countless hours behind electronic computing screens. But by those who've written the pages of financial and economic history. Many have deliberately chosen multi-syllabic terms and dense, obscure language to bore and confuse you. Many find themselves feeling stupid and inadequate after attempting to follow grown-up discussions about made-up pretend money. And there's a reason for that. For their crocodile act, inducing would-be victims into a vulnerable stupor is just that, a grand stage show, a pretend display to disguise the simple fact that our monetary system is but fool's gold. The promise of gold, the illusion of wealth, and the power of money in hand. So beware, dear viewers, not to nod off too quickly, or else we may veer off the road we're on much sooner than you think. Back in 2012, a listener wrote in to Paul Solman, the business and economics correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, about the charge of Occupy Wall Street protesters and Ron Paul supporters that the Federal Reserve prints money out of thin air. When I hear people say the Federal Reserve prints money out of thin air, it sounds wrong to me. They do not put more actual money into the total system. Do they? Transparency is one thing, and I want that because I think it would expose the system to how it operates. Uh, but there's more to it than that. To me, to me, it's the power. It's the power and the authority that gravitates into the hands of a small group of people who can create money out of thin air. This is an ominous power. And Solman responded by saying, in part, money is and has always been nothing more nor less than a promise between people, a token of value mutually agreed to. I give you dollar bills, copper pennies, cowrie shells, tally sticks, whale's teeth, twisted strips of metal. They're all just IOUs. That is, they're promises that the token will be exchangeable for something else. The convenience of modern money has evolved from an age-old search for a satisfactory medium of exchange. To the extent that everyone believes in the token, it has value. To the extent that the belief erodes, so does the value. Hence, credit comes from the Latin credere, to believe. The two main forms of money created by the U.S. government are currency, about a trillion dollars worth out there at the moment, remember this was 2012, and federal reserves, electronic blips on the books of financial institutions, mainly banks. The Fed does indeed create these so-called reserves, quote, out of thin air, as you put it, when it buys securities to increase the money supply. But so what? It's no different than minting more currency. That too is, quote, fiat money. From the Latin fiat, let it be done. As in God's fiat lux, let there be light, or Italy's fiat punto, let there be a really small car. And then he wrote, Look, someone has to create money, right? There's a good old-fashioned word for people us. We call them suckers. And there are other people. People who stay up nights figuring out how to take away what they've got. As you see, the top hat is still worn, but today only by a few. We are at a historic turning point. Money as debt is a form of slavery. It's just, it's changed everything. Congress, in essence, has ceded total control of the value of our money 
to a secretive by a central bank. I don't hang around trying to read the entrails of what some statement in the administration may say because it's our responsibility to make up our mind about these things. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Picture a party of the nation's greatest bankers stealing out of New York on a private railroad car under cover of darkness, stealthily hiding hundreds of miles south. The key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control and also we will have the technology to enforce that. It was a secret meeting at the time, they told nobody about it. The details came out later, but this is the place where the most important people in the world first came up with the formal plan to create the Federal Reserve. This place is crazy. I have alleged that there is a money trust. Better, Better for the state, for the state relative to Better cash. America was discovered by the people of the world. Explorers of many nations charted the land and opened it to their people. Columbus of Italy, Balboa, and Pons de Leon of Spain, Sir Walter Raleigh of England, Henry Hudson, and other brave exploring men who sailed their ships into unknown waters and found the land of America. Americans are not generally taught English history, but it was with the 1688 Glorious Revolution, a bloodless coup, that the English Bill of Rights emerged, right at a century before America's Bill of Rights, but also alongside the Bank of England, established in 1694. For it is not often observed that Britain's new epoch of civil liberties and limited monarchy, which supplanted a millennium of absolute monarchs and theoretically reigned in arbitrary taxation, was purchased at the price of her central bank. For all of England's affairs henceforth would be tethered to this institution of issuance, a new crown of crowns, new freedoms bound together with new controls. Energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed. If that axiom holds true, then its historical corollary is surely evident in what was a very clear divesting of the crown's energy in King Charles I, who met his end and who was decapitalized from his crown amid England's bloody civil war in the middle of the 1600s, and the national wealth transferred, reinvested, rather than in a single sovereign king, in so many sovereigns minted and circulated per capita throughout its population. The crowned head is identified with the sun and its force of life and fertility, which in the crowning of a sovereign is conferred on the whole kingdom. Ultimately, the same image same representation of ultimate power up above, from which the sovereign theoretically derives. Reflected in this earthly domain, in each vested piece of capital, gold, or silver, each head pegged to the crown, delegated, recapitalized units of energy, currency flowing in circulation, replicated over and over in coronation, that sacred act of crowning a sovereign, vesting concentrated authority built upon trust, energy flowing to the rightful monarch, investing a vessel divinely appointed, in theory, with a crown upon the head, like striking so many sovereign crowns 
authorized wealth, sourced as if from the sun above. Shining blaze of its corona reflected in the shining crowns coined. Crowns poured into the crown, sovereigns flowing to and from the sovereign. The energy of the people, subject to the crown, connected to its appointed sovereign. A royal highness, one head, become the crowned capital of all, all that its kingdom had built and become. The ruling face of its monarch, invested with the power of the crown, reinvested per capita upon the face of the coin of the realm, imprinted with the face of its monarch taken at face value in proportion to its weight in minted currencies, a unit of energy bestowed with the sovereign image upon its face, exuding and circulating the attributes of the sovereign, sending ultimate energy of the crown into the per capita hands laboring broadly on behalf of the empire. Executing, according to the dictates of the sovereign, unbroken in Europe for a thousand years, until the turns of history saw ultimately a sovereign executed, vested capital, decapitalized, separated from its crown, and all the energy sourced from above, divested with a singular blow, flowing back to the people in the body politic. The unclaimed coins at the end of our battle indicate the number of our losses. The unclaimed coins at the end of our battle indicate the number of our losses. Part 1 After a prolonged Shakespearean nightmare of centuries whereupon abuses were suffered under cover of divine right of kings who acted more like tyrants, England's civil war and the subsequent beheading of King Charles I in 1649 was not only a pivotal challenge to absolute monarchical power, it became a literal divesting in that regal authority. That authority would soon be placed elsewhere. Oh yes, yes it would. Official modern bank history begins with Stockholm's Banco, founded by Johan Palmstruck in 1657. Palmstroke finally got the bank approved by a king of Sweden, Charles X Gustav, on the third try, after promising that the crown would receive half the bank's profits. Because, of course, Stockholm's Banco was the first European bank to print banknotes in 1661. In 1668, Stockholm's Banco began issuing too many loans and printing too many banknotes without collateral. Imagine that! leading to the bank's takeover by the Swedish parliament, along with Palmstruck's privilege to operate a bank. Due to his bad bookkeeping, Palmstruck was the West's first central banker sentenced to death for printing too much money, and the Swedish government established the world's oldest central bank. In recent years, it became the first to issue negative interest rates. During King William's war against France in 1690, the Massachusetts Bay Colony issued an emergency stopgap in the form of a government-backed IOU. After promised loot that would have come from the taking of Quebec City failed, and the defeated army faced a crisis in paying its soldiers. This is considered the first paper currency issued in the modern Western Hemisphere. England's enchantment with absolute monarchy officially ended with the Glorious Revolution in 1688, ushering in limited monarchy and England's Bill of Rights in 1689. The vacuum of power created would ultimately lead to the installation of the Bank of England in 1694. Let's start our tour with the hub of the city. At the center, geographically, and from the point of view of importance, stands the Bank of England. It issues the money we use. It is the government's bank. Which saw the nation's energy redistributed through banking rather than kings and queens. Critically, one cannot cut the head off of a bank. To pay for recent expensive wars against France, the privately owned Bank of England bankrolled the buildup of the British Navy that would, quote, dominate the next 200 years globally, through the War of Spanish Succession and beyond. Most of the world's modern central banks would be based on the Bank of England's model. Fun fact! In 1954, archaeologists found that the original home of the bank on Walbrook had been built on top of the remains of a Roman temple to Mithras, 
a god associated with contracts whose name is literally Akkadian for contract. London, the capital of Britain, is also the financial capital of the world. It was the Romans nearly 2,000 years ago who built London Wall. The government of the city is to this day steeped in the traditions built up in its long history. Findings at the site included a statue to Bacchus and a cache of discarded chicken bones believed to have been used in initiation ceremonies and sacrifices. Shortly after the bank was established, England authorized a re-coinage in 1696, eliminating small denomination notes below 50 pounds. With average people earning something like 20 pounds annually, the majority of England never held these banknotes. In 1697, Parliament barred the creation of new joint stock companies. It was an intentionally anti-competitive move that favored monopoly by requiring a royal charter. In 1708, the Bank of England was granted a monopoly to issue banknotes tied to gold deposits, which were known as virtual money. In 1717, Sir Isaac Newton, in his capacity as comptroller of the Royal Mint, effectively put England on the gold standard at the expense of valuations in silver. The notorious South Sea bubble hit in 1720. It was the modern world's first global financial bubble, and it burst in London. An economic rival to both the Bank of England and the East India Company, the South Sea Company was founded in 1711 as a public-private partnership that would consolidate national debt and facilitate trade with Spanish America, which required a permit from Spain. Supposedly, the Asiento slave trade permit was the only one Spain could allow Britain at the time, who took it over from France circa 1713. Thus, London's major financial investors began speculating on the British monopoly over the South Sea slave trade. But when everything in this amoral scheme got stretched out like a slinky from wild speculation and bounced back and then crawled down one stair after another with everyone's money, despite this rampant speculation being profitable for a few, most investors, including many aristocrats' fortunes, were completely wiped out. The king was shielded from financial loss by an act of parliament. Because of course. Exemplifying these losses was Isaac Newton, England's most prominent scientist and one of its most prominent money men, who despite having formulated the third law of motion and establishing that he understood equal and opposite forces, lost the equivalent of tens of millions of today's dollars in the South Sea bubble crash, something between 10 and 20,000 pounds or more. Interestingly, the South Sea bubble of 1720 was immediately followed by a similar crash on the Paris stock market known as the Mississippi bubble. John Law, sometimes described as a Scottish economist and other times described as a convicted murderer and millionaire gambler, presided over an early paper money scheme involving land speculation and real estate in connection with the French exploitation of Louisiana, transferred about a century later to the U.S. in the Louisiana Purchase. After it became apparent that economic expectations for the undeveloped territory were heavily exaggerated, investors began demanding their paper notes be converted to gold and silver en masse prompting the bubble to burst in 1720, a year for obvious bubble bursting. Between 1723 and 1729, paper currency became a hotly debated issue in the colonies as a financial solution to their many problems was wanting. But the badly arranged schemes deployed in colonies such as New England and South Carolina were apparently the equivalent of a child's badly drawn crayon doodles that no one wants to hang up on the fridge, as it doesn't take much to conjure up scribbles on paper, cry mommy mommy, and expect a line of credit in return. In 1723 and 1726, Pennsylvania passed paper currency legislation. And despite fears of a similar fate to other failed colonial paper money schemes, its relatively responsible management ended up making Pennsylvania the shining example of how not to overissue and cause runaway inflation. The key difference appears to be that the currency was pegged to land value rather than gold, and it maintained stability. Demand for currency itself, a workable currency system that would meet the dire needs of colonial conditions, drove debates during the time period in the hope that solutions would emerge. Benjamin Franklin himself wrote on the topic in 1729, advocating the issuance of additional paper bills to meet shortages in the credit loan note system then in place in Pennsylvania. In 1751, 1764, and 1773, the British Parliament passed currency acts creating strict regulations on colonial paper money, which pressed upon various important pressure points in colonial life, though you, dear listener, would find it too dry to dole out in detail. Suffice to say, there were restrictions in the issuance of paper money and banking activities in New England, i.e. policies to not make it rain, 
and the use of these paper notes was only authorized for payment of public debts and taxes, but banned for use in paying private debts, sending all the cream to the government and not to small business. By 1540, a silver glut caused a collapse in prices across Europe. The American mines would, at this point, simply have stopped functioning and the entire project of American colonization foundered had it not been for the demand from China. But how exactly did the new global economy cause the collapse of living standards in Europe? One thing we do know, it clearly was not by making large amounts of precious metal available for everyday transactions. If anything, the effect was the opposite. While Europeans were stamping out enormous numbers of rials, thalers, ducats, and doubloons, which became the new medium of trade from Nicaragua to Bengal, almost none found their way into the pockets of ordinary Europeans. Instead, we hear constant complaints about the shortage of currency. This was the case in most of Europe. Despite the massive influx of metal from the Americas, most families were so low on cash that they were regularly reduced to melting down the family silver to pay their taxes. This was because taxes had to be paid in metal. Everyday businesses, in contrast, continued to be transacted much as it had in the Middle Ages by means of various forms of virtual credit money, tallies, promissory notes, or, within smaller communities, simply by keeping track of who owed what to whom. What really caused the inflation is that those who ended up in control of the bullion, governments, bankers, large-scale merchants, were able to use that control to begin changing the rules, first by insisting that gold and silver were money, and second, by introducing new forms of credit money for their own use, while slowly undermining and destroying the local systems of trust that had allowed small-scale communities across Europe to operate largely without the use of metal currency. This was a political battle, even if it was also a conceptual argument about the nature of money. The new regime of bullion money could only be imposed through almost unparalleled violence, not only overseas, but at home as well. In much of Europe, the first reaction to the price revolution and accompanying enclosures of common lands was not very different from what had so recently happened in China. Thousands of one-time peasants fleeing or being forced out of their villages to become vagabonds or masterless men, a process that culminated in popular insurrections. The reaction of European governments, however, was entirely different. The rebellions were crushed, and this time, no subsequent concessions were forthcoming. Vagabonds were rounded up, exported to the colonies as indentured laborers, and drafted into colonial armies and navies or, eventually, set to work in factories at home. Almost all of this was carried out through the manipulation of debt. These monetary pressures were compounded by the Seven Years' War, aka the French and Indian War, of 1756 to 1763, which in many respects amounted to a contest for dominance in North America between Britain, France, and Spain, and which also involved much of Europe, Russia, and parts of South America. On the front end of the pivotal Seven Years' Conflict, Britain disincentivized white indentured servants, the primary labor force in the colonies up until this point, so that they would join the military and serve in the Seven Years' War instead rather than the seven years in indentured labor to landlords, where after they typically won their individual and economic independence. Instead, whites were recruited into armies en masse and Britain began incentivizing primarily African slaves for labor, greatly expanding the commonality of slavery in the colonies, which its banks and stock companies profited from considerably. This shift in policy not only marked the difference in colonial life economically and with respect to labor, but in the base conditions of people who once came in droves to suffer the hardships of quasi-voluntary labor force that they eventually earned their way out of, 
and exchanging that system for a labor economy based around outright perpetual bondage slavery, where physical hardships were compounded with psychological abuse and distorted legal concepts that defined some people as property and as something less than human. This moral handicap and still lingering curse on America, derived from specific policies and investments that imposed the slave trade economy on the colonies even against objections, was complained about in the long train of abuses of the Declaration of Independence, though most people seem to have forgotten that point today. By about 1759, gold shortages during the Seven Years' War led to the Bank of England issuing 10-pound notes, making smaller denominations available as people struggled with finances. By 1793, with the French Revolution, five-pound notes were introduced. The more wars you have, the smaller amounts of money you get to have. Thus, the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 marked the beginning of the causes of the American War of Independence. The aftermath left Britain dominant in the New World, but it came with a heavy price tag. Aggressive tax measures set by British Parliament in attempting to tax their American colonists to recoup the price of the Seven Years' War set off the Stamp Act revolt. Which was, let's face it, angry, furious riots that made British lawmakers glad as f at the distance between them and the subsequent protests, most notably the Tea Party Rebellion, which fueled the rise of revolution and independence on the back of heavy taxes and tight money policies. And thus, Mother England took on the role of Prince John in the Robin Hood-esque tale of double-squeezing an already contracting economy living by the slow-trickling veins of scarce coin and often inflationary paper currencies in the colonies. Banks were largely a confidence game, and they needed public trust to keep credit flowing and the economy growing. The crisis of 1772 demonstrated this after a panic and financial crisis hit in London, then spread to Europe and dozens of banks collapsed. In 1773, with revolution only two years away, Parliament amended the Currency Act again, finally authorizing the issuance of paper money as legal tender for public debts under the sovereignty of Parliament. According to historian Jack Sosen, the British government had made its point. After nine years, the colonial agents had secured a paper currency for the provinces, but the Americans had tacitly, if not implicitly, acknowledged the authority of Parliament, and in the final analysis, this was really all the imperial government wanted. On December 16, 1773, Boston Sons of Liberty masqueraded as Mohawk Indians and dumped several tons of tea, an expensive commodity monopolized by the East India Company, into the harbor. With the first shots fired in April 1775, the Continental Congress authorized but would not regulate paper money issued by each of the 13 colonies in order to finance revolution and maintain exchange during hostilities. This convenience of modern money has evolved from an age-old search for a satisfactory medium of exchange. Printers, such as Franklin's former printing house, were printing paper money with decorative outlines as watermark and serial numbers matching the set issuance. However, lack of coordination and other pressures led to a massive overprinting of currency, without checking it to retirement schemes through tax and bond. Moreover, as historians have now understood, the British hired artists to forge colonial script and circulated it liberally, draining its value almost completely via overabundance. Benjamin Franklin documented on this form of economic warfare, noting that the counterfeits were so good it took some time to detect them. Hmm. As a result, these continentals lost all their value, and the currency collapsed entirely between 1778 and 1780. As a result of the currency collapse, the Continental Congress chartered the privately owned Bank of North America to operate as a de facto central bank, minting money under its superintendent of finance, Robert Morris. The bank, opened in Philadelphia in 1782, was funded by nearly half a million in silver coins loaned by the French. Now extremely rare, the Nova Constellatio was the first coin minted in the U.S. The bank's operations were based on recommendations by Alexander Hamilton, a close associate of bank superintendent Morris, who was later memorialized in the apotheosis of George Washington on the Washington Capitol Rotunda as the alchemical receipt of gold from the Greek god Hermes. It should be noted the Bank of England also uses the Staff of Hermes as a central symbol of its institution, which can be seen surrounding the ceilings of its headquarters building in the City of London, and has also been printed on British banknotes. During the eight years the American War for Independence lasted, the British crown lost its colonies, but the new country remained dominated by British culture. 
General George Washington, a hero of the Seven Years' War from an old line English family, married into the Fairfax family, Virginia Colony's wealthiest landowners, and spent the duration of the often desperately fought Revolutionary War holding a significant leveraged position in the British banking system he was fighting against. George Washington remained a shareholder and received dividends from the Bank of England until the conclusion of the war, only selling his British bank shares after independence was fully secured. In the prevailing years of the early United States, the Constitution was written and debated in 1789, with the amended Bill of Rights ratified in 1791, a solid century after Britain's 1689 Bill of Rights, which bundled neatly with the charter for the Bank of England in 1694. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution effectively prohibits the several states from issuing their own currency. When it says, no state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark, or reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin to tender in payments of debts. Taking office in 1789, President Washington appointed Alexander Hamilton. Yes, that Hamilton. I could sing, I could dance, and I'm down with my homies in higher finance. So give me all your debts, and I will make it credit through a strong centralized federal government. For the birds, I mean the people. For the birds, I mean the people. For the banks, I mean the people. For the banks, I mean the people. I mean the people. as the first Secretary of Treasury on September 11th of that year, a controversial figure most notably opposed by Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. The following year in 1790, Hamilton issued his report on a national bank, advocating the creation of the Bank of the United States modeled after the Bank of England, i.e. a private shareholder's bank to support national interests. Hamilton proposed a further centralization of federal government powers, absorbing state debts into federal debt, then about $75 million, which thereby established credit with international governments. Hamilton defended his proposal by stating in part, quote, The debt of the United States was the price of liberty. So the price of liberty is having a central bank. Didn't hear him singing that one in the Disney musical, did you? And you know it's gaining interest for our international lenders. Surrender under Caesar and make Washington, D.C. our top vendor. Wall Street, Rothschild in the house. Yeah. Credit systems. Like, if you have no credit, you can't get credit. And then you got to go into debt in order to prove that you can pay the debt to, like, get good credit. Right? There's really no fresh start to anything. It's just like, no, can you ruin something in order to like gain it first (laughs) instead of just completely building from nothing? In 1791, the first bank of the United States, a private bank, is established on the basis of Hamilton's plans. Congress granted it a 20-year charter for the purpose of promoting the creditworthiness of the new nation, absorbing debts of states, paying off debts, and establishing a common currency. It was to be funded by a government-imposed excise tax. The bank was opposed not only by Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, who more so favored states' rights, but also James Madison, who wrote on the Federalist Papers with Hamilton in the atmosphere of the constitutional debates. Jefferson and Madison then concurred, claiming that the bank was unconstitutional and that it benefited merchants and investors at the expense of the majority of the population. Sound familiar? Ultimately, Washington sided with Hamilton and signed the law against considerable public opposition, because everyone else went. By August and September 1791, markets had become unstable and capricious, resulting in Hamilton's partnership with William Seton of the Bank of New York, authorizing the institution to buy 150000 of public debt with government guaranteeing the losses. Prices in Hamilton's first crisis recovered to normal, as of September 12, 1791, and established the Bank of New York's bona fides in playing the role of financial rescuer. The point is, as soon as they had the bank, they had some crises because that is how this works. 
The Panic of 1792 credit crisis was a direct result of rampant speculation after the expansion of credit by the freshly instituted Bank of the United States. Prominent banks deliberately drove up U.S. debt security prices but defaulted their loans and triggered a classic bank run. Because you can't have a bank without a bank run. Overriding Jefferson's opposition on the Cabinet Sinking Fund Commission, Hamilton convinced Vice President John Adams, Chief Justice John Jay, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph to engage in open market purchases of securities, again with the government paying to stabilize and normalize lending via the Bank of New York and also the Bank of Maryland, which literally no one ever heard of. Financial crisis struck again in the young United States in 1796, because of course it did. Speculators living in splendor in the eastern cities had their eyes on these rich new areas and by political and financial power were able to seize or acquire legal rights to land they had never seen. As the bubble burst on land speculation, the Bank of England responded by suspending payments in gold as of February 25, 1797 via the Bank Restriction Act, which would not let up until 1821. Account holders were nervous about the threat of invasion by France, and bank directors began to fear a bad game of musical chairs with their gold coins and whatnot as the reserves were quickly starved. The U.S. passed the Bankruptcy Act of 1800 in response, which again modeled on British banking practices. Under the law, petitioning a creditor could only be done by merchants, bankers, and brokers. Very in crowd. <laughs> Foreign reserves and exchange rates. Perhaps in some ways it wasn't America's revolutionary principles, its constitution, republicanism, or democracy that would hold the new nation together, so much as its credit worthiness. So many bonds and notes, backed by the central government, and floated on markets by the Bank of the United States, that the new freedom would be assured. Debt scattered across the several states was too dispersive, too uncertain, but debt consolidated under the federal umbrella could be managed by its chartered bank as an asset, securitizing the debt with the guarantee and power of the federal government. The real power was the people, sort of. It was the debt per capita that became an instrument with which to trade future output, the price per labor, expectations to expand and develop, the intentions and promises to repay, to continue to dig deeper in, to produce repeat transactions, and reincur more debt. Thus, Hamilton sold the assumption of state debts in order to facilitate lending from European powers, by superseding, almost immediately, the limited and specified powers enumerated in the Constitution the United States as a central entity, the crown above its people, and not just an instrument of its people, the U.S. government could establish itself as a trustworthy borrower. These restructured debts empowered not only the federal government in relation to its states, but the powers of the financial sector inside America. Hamilton wrote, The debt of the United States was the price of liberty. The faith of America has been repeatedly pledged for it, with solemnities that give particular force to the obligation. Meanwhile, revolutionary fervor swept Europe as the concrete set in the new United States. With the French Republic in assent, its ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternité, its citizens turned to decapitating its former monarch. King Louis XVI was executed on January 21, 1793, and the new French Republican calendar month of Pluvot, which signaled the, quote, rainy phase of winter, a symbolic rebirth in rain where the deposed head of France was energetically returned to the people, the ancient regime dying away. Taschen's Book of Symbols observed that, quote, the ubiquitous use of the guillotine during the French Revolution may have been partly a ritual attempt to redistribute energy and vitality from the dominant aristocracy to the rest of society. End quote. The concentrated power of the crown undone into a system theoretically for the people, even if it went dark and bloody. 
did the onlookers really dip their handkerchiefs in the corporal remains of their former regal chief to take a sanguine souvenir, a sort of keepsake of the lifeblood of the empire, a key source of energy, now flowing back to the source from whence it came? If so, it wasn't to be a permanent state. When the revolutions within the revolution led to its own ends, the vacuum of power opened way for dominance of Napoleon by 1799, and the Bank of France, its central bank, quickly emerging in the year 1800, giving us eternally clues to the issuance and backing not just of currencies, but of regimes and governments. Spongy money, now what done? Spongy money, ha ha! Spongy money, gonna now what done? Spongy money, oh spongy money, gonna now what done? Great your potato, ah great your potato. Put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gonna make it yaller. Love, girl, love, love, girl, love. Love, girl, love, girl, spend your money. Ah, spend your money, never done. Spend. Oh, mama, go spend your money, go never done. Hey, I know you like it. Oh, money, go never done. Spend your money. I went down to town the other day. Spend your money. I see all them boys getting bouncy. Now spend your money. What I call my money get five dollars go on the trip. Now spend your money. Oh, mama, gonna mama, 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 gonna spend your money. Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, love, girl, love, girl, love, love, girl, love, love, girl, love, girl, spend your money. Oh, spend your money, gonna know what's done. Oh, you're going to narrow. 
You can't do that run. Oh, you put one half a yard in it, don't make it wider. Oh, sponge your money, go now a done. Sponge the money. Oh, mama, 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 go sponge your money, go. La ni ni, la 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 Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, oh, love, girl, love, girl, sponge, I sponge your money, go now, I done, oh, sponge your money, go now, I done, oh, spend your money, go now, I done, oh, grate your potato, grate your potato, put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gonna make it yellow. Oh, sponge your money, go now, I don't. <laughs> hey, that, 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 that. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. La, 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 that, 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 that. Sponge your money, now I don't. Sponge your money.